to speak. So we're really um, lucky to have Dr. Silver come and speak. Um, you know, Dr. we've had, we've grown over the years with our field, absolutely. But we turned to Dr. Silver for our most cases, and um, he's been great enough to go over specific cases in the past. He can um, talk to families directly, and we appreciate you coming and talking a little bit about how you go about um, assessing the case, you know, how do you deal with these ethical issues about the postnatal management of and our um, people who have called in saying elsewhere, please be aware that at the end of the presentation, you will have time for questions and answers. And for those who are just calling in, you also can ask questions if you wish. Associate Menzel, who is also a member of the Clinical Ethics Committee that happens to be the genetic counselor working with you, will use the case. Ethical issues surrounding the postnatal management of a severe clinical anomaly. We have reached the desk of Dr. Mary Denaro. I am unavailable at this time to take your call. Please feel free to leave a message at the beep. If this is an emergency or you need to speak immediately, please. Learning objectives today: um, participants will learn foregoing life or withholding life prolonging care as outlined by the AAP, the AMA, and the NRP will reflect the selected case of a fetus with serious congenital malformations to be followed by a review of the prenatal consultation, the parent's experience, and related ethical aspects. And inclusion, um, seven ethical items adapted from the Mercy Hospital Ethics of Delivery Room Care will be presented as a model that can be relevant to the ethical approach to fetuses and infants with a very serious congenital malformation. Um, a case um, that uh, is uh, some, some from reality and somewhat from bits of other cases brought into it. Um, it's impossible to do what we do and not be emotionally affected by our cases. Um, we simply feel sad or empathetic with our patients, and sometimes we feel proud of our patients and admire our patients. And sometimes feel dislike for or angry towards our patients. Um, keep these emotions in check for the most part when interacting with patients, but sometimes feelings linger and weigh on us after meeting with a family. The cases are often the ones for which we find or feel an ethical dilemma. This may be the patient's beliefs and decisions or in counseling and action. Case I'll present is a case that is created with bits and pieces of cases that all are in you common. You have reached the desk the of Dr. That at some point Point, they cause some angst among members of either the prenatal or postnatal care team. Um, and in this case, you may or may not find that it poses an ethical dilemma to you. So this is a patient who was referred at 21 weeks, MRI, ultrasound, and neurology consultation with prenatal diagnosis of an open neural tube defect and hydrocephalus. The prenatal findings at 21 weeks. The ultrasound findings included open neural tube defect, also a VSD, bilateral club foot, and abnormal positioning of one hand. The family was by neurology and the genetic counselor regarding the open neural tube defect and concern for increasing hydrocephalus, in particular at this early gestational age. The love and underlying genetic syndrome was discussed and the option of amnio was discussed. And about in utero repair for an open neural tube defect, but told by the team that the cardiac defect would disqualify them from being a candidate. They went ahead and did research on their own, called several centers around the country, and they were able to find another fetal surgery center who told them that the cardiac defect would not necessarily disqualify them. I know where that center is. <laughs> but that a normal karyotype was uh, necessary for the in utero repair. Um, the, uh, because of this information, then opted for amniocentesis type was consistent with that. So all of you know about trisomy 18, but just a very quick review. Chromosome abnormality involving an extra chromosome 18 in all the cells. More than 130 different congenital abnormalities associated with these diagnosed with trisomy 18 in the second trimester will die in utero, maybe more. Generally, it's a lethal condition. Um, 
type 18 has congenital heart defect. Um, less than 1% of fetuses with trisomy have an open neural tube defect, but in general, we talk about 50% of babies die within their first year. Survive the first year, the majority will have no ambulation or verbal communication. Oh, okay. Children can smile and laugh and interact in this regard with their family. Oh, okay. Reaction to this diagnosis from the family um, was by the center um, that they had gone to for any type of NTD repair given the trisomy 18 diagnosis, and they were very, very upset about this. They felt that that was not um, fair that just because the fetus had trisomy 18, they would be qualified from the surgery. They kind of be a test case um, in that uh, center. Um, and not ultimately, the reality of the diagnosis was discussed with the family. They seemed to understand the diagnosis and its implications. Please put yourself on mute on if you're calling into the conference. We hear a lot of background noise. Next step was to talk with the delivery plan, what their wishes were. So they returned to meet with a neonatologist and the palliative care team to discuss delivery planning at a nearby hospital. They indicated that their birth plan was um, that their wishes were for a C-section delivery and immediate transfer of the baby to the hospital for surgery management of the open neural tube defect and the hydrocephalus. Um, the effect wasn't as um, essential in terms of needing immediate attention at birth. All teams at the delivery hospital and at the children's hospital were made aware and were supportive of their plan. So, born by C-section, CPAP was administered. The baby was baptized and transferred to the children's hospital. Um, day two of life, the neurosurgeon repaired the open neural tube defect, and the baby was placed on an external shunt. At one of age, the baby had a VP shunt placed. And weeks following, two days following the placement of that shunt, the baby was still intubated and the wound was leaking. Two weeks of age, the wound from the VP shunt to hiss, exposed to tubing. Neurosurgeons removed the shunt and placed an EVD. Fans expressed their wishes to continue with this type of care, give the baby every possible chance to survive, but a best interest in having this done with limited suffering. Express the goal of having skin to skin contact with the baby and bringing the baby home. Um, the parents uh, ultimately opted for removal of the EV following discussion with the neurosurgeon about the fact that other surgical management options were highly unlikely to be successful. So essentially, the surgeon kind of did any other neurosurgical options for this family and did not recommend any of them. Um, the family then requested a second opinion from another children's hospital about the benefits and risks of this procedure. The family did bring the baby home to be with them with the support of a home hospice care team. They then traveled with the baby to another city within a few days of being home for a second opinion. Um, the surgical team, they were deemed ineligible for the procedure there, and the baby passed away very shortly after that trip, within about two weeks of coming home. Any questions about the case for me? Presented, it came alive, didn't it? I will start uh, by mentioning uh, the current policies of neonatal resuscitation of the American Academy of Pediatrics that were established in 2007. And of course, uh, they say that the appropriate course of action is based on the best estimates of the infant's prognosis. Death is very likely, and there is high risk of severe morbidity. Intensive care is not indicated. What is likely, and risk of unacceptable severe morbidity is low. Intensive care is clearly indicated. And this is that fall between uh, certain but poor prognosis referred as to the gray zone. 
parental desires should determine the treatment approach. So this particular case is, is a very bad case, but it really falls into the first uh, category, early death is very likely, rather than the third, which is what the parents were uh, saying. Uh, so from that, from the perspective of the AAP. Oh, which one is? Yeah, that's right. This one. Yeah. Uh, from the A, it's a bit similar. The considerations: what is best for the newborn? Hands of therapy would succeed. The with treatment and non-treatment. To which the therapy is successful, extend life, the comfort associated with the therapy, anticipated quality of life for the newborn with and without treatment. It's interesting that the AP puts a lot of emphasis on the parents' opinion. Uh, the AMA directs itself directly to the doctors. It probably assumes that the doctors talk with the parents and take this in mind, but it's not mentioned. This is a little bit uh, older. Well, what do you do now? Let me get out. <laughs> Let's see if I press here what happens. Oh, this is killing me. Well, I can still see it in my room. Yeah. The next, yeah, that's fine. Okay. In the right one. The National Resuscitation Program. Uh, specific situations in which it is ethically permissible to withhold resuscitation. Educational age, they mention parameters, birth weight, anomalies, our case, coupled with death and high morbidity, and the examples less than 23 weeks, less than 4 grams, and in separately, trisomy 13 or 18. Guidance from the AP, AMA, the NRP. Simply educate us uh, to, to a logical way of thinking about it. It's not all. Every case is different, and uh, we're going to address that now. The criteria for when to resuscitate, you know, they use theology scoring systems, clinical intuition, appearance in the delivery room. Uh, multifactorial approaches, uh, female gender, single tongue gestation, denatal steroids, etc. So, um, is that uh, we cannot do a dictum of what to do, but a thinking <coughs> about what to do. Since the AA and others have not put in a parental perspective, I think this is an area that needs work. How parents see this have shown clearly that parents want to be involved in resuscitation decisions, that often don't understand their options. Even more strangely, they do not recall discussing options with providers when, when you study them like uh, boss in Baltimore had done the study that she published in pediatrics in 2008. And so that physicians charting for the patients indicated that the options for delivery and resuscitation were discussed and the collection. There is a for this phenomenon, but there are speculations. 
one explanation is, is that the parents are so overwhelmed, so tense, and upset by everything that's happened, that the whole thing is a word, and they can't listen appropriately, and so out. The other thing is that many of us doctors are trained in a certain language, and medicalese, which is very clear to us, so we put it into the record, may not be clear at all to the parents who have an understanding uh, because it's respectful to the doctor, but it's not real understanding. That, that's an important issue to think when we're looking at the parental expectations. Studies understand about what the parental expectations are, and in general, parents, like in this case that we discussed, uh, more positive than physicians regarding outcome, so this should not surprise us. Uh, they do go through a period of grief, because this discovery of a congenital anomaly shifts the parental identity, so it crashes the <coughs> that they have of a normal uh, family. Uh, what they make their decisions, often it's religion, but maybe some kind of spirituality, or with hope. And the, the hope becomes little and little. They hope for this and this and this, and whatever, you know. Uh, there was a many of, uh, of babies with trisomy 18 smiling in response to the, and sometimes that's finally hope for. Um, desire clinicians to develop compassion and provide emotional support to those who counsel on the basis of a protocol. And that is meant that in protocols given by the different societies are adhered to in a scientific way to do anything wrong but it's not that well with the parental expectations. Uh, everybody in this team, because I know you guys do meet parental expectations in that area. Uh, so that is how to frame the prenatal consultation. Uh, this framing of medical prognosis is very important. One thing that I didn't put in this slide in some services, that parents get discordant prognosis because of the number of people involved and uh, of people are entitled to have discordant uh, prognosis, discordant ideas about this based on their experience or what or how the, the case, the patient is. But it's very important that if that's the case, that a person describes the different points of view um, rather than leaving it anarchic and for the parents to respond on to whatever has been said. Uh, the thing is, uh, when the parents a prognosis that is really good for viral, will choose resuscitation. That is, that's fine. Then, if you are told that the chance of death and disability is very different, negative framing, they will often choose not to resuscitate. So it puts the person that gives the prognosis in, in a very powerful position. What's wrong with that? But about this uh, influencing. And so I'll go on later on. Influencing is practical and legitimate. So we should be alert to that. Quality of life is it when we have a case we discuss is as a very central element. If, if he uses poor quality of life as the of non initiation or withdrawal of intensive care for high-risk newborn. 
awards. Um, uh, it's important here to notice the many papers by Siegel uh, in which the measured quality of life of survival of neonatal intensive care patients and doctors felt the about it, parents not. They studied, in other words, parents accepted a quality of life that doctors and nurses would not. The thing that she did, which was very intelligent, she actually interviewed with control group teenagers that were survivors of uh, this, uh, this neonatal terrible illnesses. And there was no difference according to the kids in the life of kids had suffered tremendously with uh, uh, all kinds of neurological impairments in the general population. Now, could it be on the part of those teenagers? Could it be that they were much more sure and taking care than teens in the general population? But for whatever reason, the qualitative issue is that and nurses, we may have a different view, and we have to be careful in our analysis of quality of life. I'm not saying we consider it, but we should consider that others think differently than we do. Uh, of course, uh, the thing that would have been in the case that we presented was the option of comfort care. And uh, basically, when we offer that option, uh, what we assure parents that this is acceptable and a compassionate decision for the infant, that this is part of the practice of medicine, and that they need to be supported and the primary goal to shift to comfort and, and peace at the time of their life with the family. And Many things are written with guilt and is a different experience than the way we see it, which is that they feel that if they consent to this, they are killing their child. And that is one of the reasons behind the movement of changing, which we did at Children's Hospital, of changing DNR to a negative thing to not resuscitate, which is too cold, allowing for a natural death is the experience of how all died years ago, you know, and it, so this is where, you know, very often a favorite nurse, a social worker, a trusted doctor, etc., can make such a tremendous difference on how they perceive this. That basically what parents want to do is they want to be good parents. And the that we will give them is a good parent uh, can let go. So the ethical principles involved in this prenatal consults are different really than in other areas of medicine. Um, there are many ways of looking at ethics, but one that's traditional in the United States, and believe me, there are many other competing ones, it helps us autonomy, balance, magnificence, and justice, which are basically what we call Georgetown Mantra Track, because it was developed at, uh, at the Baptist School at, at Georgetown. Horns are enabled exercise self-determination, so we have a surrogate, and the best ones are usually the parents. Uh, what is expected of the parents is to act in the best interest of the child. Uh, the beneficence and non-maleficence is uh, the treatment dilemma, which is often enhanced by difficulty with prognostication. 
the price of the 18, unless difficulty with prognostication and other situations. Still, you know, is the case with trisomy 18 that will live longer. Um, you know, many little conditions are called little conditions but you don't treat them. And, you know, if you would, tre you would treat everybody intensely, uh, it would be a higher percentage of survivors. Uh, to put it all together, I really like practical applications because of typical concepts. So, in looking at uh, many different practical approaches to the terrible situations, uh, I really like the group uh, Kansas Children's uh, have uh, developed 10 points in, and they presented. Uh, in an article in the Society of Fetal and Fetal and Neonatal Medicine, and uh, they basically discuss the ethics of delivery room care. From those ten, I adapted seven, which we heard, to a the gray zone. Considering dying is not general in the infant's best interest, does not necessarily mean poor quality of life. Post resuscitation was not initiated, does not mean that one cannot withdraw treatment. Expect powerful emotions, be aware of self fulfilling prophecies, and of course, what we do well here never abandon the parents. How much time do I have? Um, keep on going. Because okay. I could develop it. Yeah. In a little bit of each one. The first one, be okay with the grade. Next decisions deserve individual analysis. That's why any of the guidelines that I mentioned at the beginning, important thing to know, let's do individual analysis. Um, Attempting to create broad black and white categories for all newborns with severe congenital malformations is taking the easy way out. Uh, we have to accept the gray zone. So in this case, my choice would have been to work with the parents, frame it, and help them accept not to do anything. Uh, you know, we have to that for them. That's the uh, well, dying is not generally in the best interest. That's kind of tongue-in-cheek, right? But the burden of care and quality of life are an important consideration. But a, a trial of life can be a reasonable option. Um, Kansas Group says, and I quote them, um, we will never have the opportunity to confront few obstacles to care if it doesn't. Care is not obligatory. It's just an option that one can discuss. Impairment does not necessarily mean poor quality of life. And uh, one can be the judge of somebody else's prospect quality of life. Force, just because the train has not left the station, it does not mean you can't get off. And just because the infant has been resuscitated in the living room, mean that tracheostomy, gastrostomy, and other surgeries have to follow. Discussion about care can be ongoing, and, and medical team can, of course, alter the course of treatment. Ethical perspective with care is ethically equivalent to withholding of care, the same that would support uh, withdrawal uh, apply to what one reasons for withholding. Uh, the powerful emotions reveal moral truths, the moral truths of the parents. Um, but not all burden should fall on the parents. So, 
for the medical care team to be somewhat directed. In most settings of parental duty may overrule logic if direction or guidance are provided. And this is the tricky part. It, it has to be done you know, when you dance a tango, you know. It has to be done in a way that the parents don't feel that you want to phone a gender, but you're guiding them based on your knowledge of them and their situation, but you're willing and open to accept that your guidance is not what they need at that time. Consoles, what we always do is we try to to make a bigger circle of people involved so the parents don't feel total burden. Often it's good to, if they're religious, to bring in the chaplain or grandparents sometimes maybe to help them through this with their experience of life. Uh, be fulfilling prophecies, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, parents request that treatment be provided for kids have resulted in longer lifespans. Not lifespans, but longer lifespans. And they were the, the older brother or the older sister may important. And of course, should abandon patients. Panic babies are on an emotional roller coaster. They may badly. They're angry, they do not visit their children, they're too distressed. Some can be very intrusive in the care of the kids and some are critical of the staff. Uh, nevertheless, they still are in need of guidance and the are most difficult to get along are often ones that might need support the most, not surprising. So this kind of a bird's view of this kind of situation, and if we're ready for questions or concerns or experiences that you may have had, let's discuss. Yes. Um, I have a question about these uh, the NICU survivors' quality of life yeah. assessments. It's a very biased population because is this people who are NICU survivors who are completely nonverbal or unable to, to respond that can't give you a quality of life assessment. So you're by definition having really the highest functioning survivors who are going to weigh in on that. Right. Yeah. So I so think it's a the, the false comparison group. They say, oh, well, the kids have the same quality of life, but only the, the icebergs. Yeah, quite, that some question. of them were quite. <laughs> functioning, but sufficient to be verbal. Parents uh, of those that were really in pretty bad shape uh, also were part of the study. It's not only one study, it's several studies that say, and when I read it, I was uh, surprised, but it's based uh, and has been repeated by other scholars. Humans sometimes ourselves and our expectations and uh, whatever we can get, we can get. It's like, like, it's like the cancer who gets metastasis and so on, but one more one more day, you know, we, we adapt. Now, the question is, how would this family have been, how would they function, they would have let go, and then they would have had another uh, baby and be, uh, you know, a more average family, etc. So these families say interesting things, because I've spoken with many, uh, such as, this kid and us a lot. And I think what they mean by that is the generosity of spirit, the dedication uh, to another human being that is diminished is, is what as a good. You mentioned female gender as a factor. In, the uh, in, in many, especially in the viability literature, um, girls that are clinically very similar to boys survive. 
I don't know the nation for that. But it seems to be that the weaker gender is the stronger. <laughs> That has been shown universally, not not only in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's something about girls that make them at that age more resilient. Okay. We don't know what it is. Are those calling in? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.